For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And may he come quickly. Amen. The Lord's Supper is a pro- proclamation of Christ's death, and it is a joyful proclamation because he doesn't have to die again. He doesn't have to suffer again. His death on the cross is enough for us to cover our sins, our transgressions, to cleanse us. It is a declaration not just of what he's done, but in hopeful anticipation of what he will do, that Jesus is coming back. We remain here on this earth in a battle with dangers all around us. And last week, we looked at what these dangers were, and we were challenged to contend earnestly for the faith, to fight for the faith, to stop being lethargic, to stop being lazy, to stop being complacent, and to stand up and do something. This week, as we continue in the book of Jude, we're going to look specifically at what we can do if we're going to fight. You say, okay, that's great, preacher. I'm ready to fight. I'm tired of my sins. I'm tired of the damage and the destruction that it causes to my marriage, to my family, to my life. I'm ready to fight, Lord. How do we do that? As we look at a few verses near the end of Jude, we're going to see that what we set our mind on is a big part of how we fight the fight. Mindset determines action. And if our mind is set on worldly things instead of godly things, we will obtain worldly results instead of the righteousness of God. I ask you to pray with me and to prepare our hearts for the word of God. Heavenly Father, as we come before you, we rejoice in the sufficiency of of your grace and the sufficiency of Christ's death and resurrection. And I pray, Lord God, for the faith to partake of Christ Jesus, our Lord, that we would be a people whose hearts are surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus, that we might be pleasing in your sight. My God, as we have partaken of the supper, we now come to partake of the word. I pray that we would humble our hearts, quiet our souls, and that you would speak to us where we are, with what we are dealing with, with what we need, to bring comfort to those who are hurting to bring strength to those who are failing, to bring conviction to those who are wavering, to bring encouragement to those who have lost hope. We have nowhere else to go, Lord. So please, give us your word now and the hearts that we need to believe. In Jesus' name I pray. Jude, verse 19, Jude writes, These are the ones who cause divisions, worldly-minded, devoid of the Spirit. I'm going to skip a good part of Jude because he basically spends what we covered last week where we ended off to today describing who the these are. And as you read through Jude, you will find that these are people who are arrogant, who speak about things that they have no clue what they're talking about, reviling angelic majesties, crossing lines they should not cross, claiming to know while still being an unreasoning animal and foolish like a dog. These are the ones who have snuck into the church congregation. He says, they've come into your love feast where the Christians would come and gather and eat and culminate in the Lord's Supper, what we have done. So to put in our context, there are people who come into the pew who say they're a Christian, 
and they sneak in. But when they leave these walls, they live like the devil. And they come with such arrogance as to sit in a pew and partake of the supper while knowing that they're about to go back out and live like the devil. Arrogance even further to teach other people to behave in such a way. These are the ones who are greedy, who speak whatever will bring them profit. And if somebody would not pay them, they would speak slanderous lies against them. These are the immoral people who would turn God's grace into licentiousness, as we saw last week, who would make excuses for their sexual deviancy as if it were okay. These are the ones who were marked out for judgment long ago, Jude says, and judgment is coming, he says, but he defines these people with one word, which is translated, these are worldly minded. In verse 19, the words for division and the word about being devoid of the Spirit, they all define what he means by worldly minded, but the key characteristic of these people is that their minds are set on the things below. Their minds are set on the natural world. Their minds are set on the materialism that surrounds us of the sinful pleasures that surround us. Their mind is set not on God and not on righteousness and not on truth, not on anything eternal, but on all the temporal things that make up this world. They are worldly minded. It's because they're worldly minded that they cause division. Because they're more concerned with getting their own way than glorifying God. And so they're willing to divide, willing to fight, willing to say whatever they need to say to get whatever they want to get. But ultimately they're worldly minded because they have not the spirit of God. See, one of the key characteristics of every believer is that every single true believer has the spirit of God. When you placed your faith in Jesus Christ, if it was true and genuine, your heart surrendered to the Lord, he filled you with his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not something that needs to be unlocked for special Christians. The Holy Spirit is not something that needs to be obtained at some point in your Christian walk. If you have the Spirit, you are a child of God. If you don't have the Spirit, you are not a child of God. That's what the Bible teaches us. And so he says these people don't have the Spirit of God. They're devoid of the Spirit because their mind is not focused on the things of the Spirit, but on the things of this world, the flesh. Believer, these people are all around us, and we need to beware of this worldly mindset. Beware of those who teach half the gospel. We have all sorts of people out there who proclaim to be Christians, who claim to be faithful teachers of God's word, but their gospel is always only part of the gospel. Or maybe it's an addition to the gospel, but they do not preach the true gospel. They're not willing to talk about the sins of men. As Derek said, there's nothing we can do to make ourselves worthy. We are not worthy, but God makes us worthy. People who don't talk about the holiness of God, that God must send sinners to hell because that's what they deserve and he is a just God. People who don't want to talk about the blood of Jesus Christ because we're too civilized to talk about such things. You have famous, renowned Christian preachers who leave out part of the gospel, enough truth to weed their way into your life and into your heart, but devoid of the spirit and thus devoid of Beware of those who speak in such ways, whether they be famous televangelists, famous preachers like who's down in Houston, or famous uh, folks who are up in Oklahoma, or whether they be simply your neighbor, your cousin, your friend, your grandma, your son, your whoever it might be. If they don't preach the gospel, if they don't teach the gospel, beware. Beware of those who turn the grace of God into licentiousness, who make excuses for their sins. It's not that bad. Things have changed. The world is different now. It's okay. If we love each other, it should be fine. They make excuses for sinful deviancies like sexual immorality. They make excuses for their greeds like everybody's got to live. We've got pay- bills to pay. They make excuses for their anger saying, I'm just not going to be walking. 
walked on. They make excuses for their sins and say, God's okay with it. Beware of such worldly-minded people because God has saved us. He has saved us by his grace, but he has saved us for holiness. He has saved us to follow Jesus, and Jesus does not live in sin. Beware of those who try to lead you into a life of sin. Most of all, Christian, beware of having these worldly mindsets yourself. It's one thing to have the people on the outside trying to influence you. It's another thing to embrace it yourself. To become so focused on what's here and what's now, to become so focused on the materialism, so focused on the pleasure, so focused on the desire, so focused on your own rights that you lose sight of God. This world will not last. God's word is very clear that this world is destined for judgment. Jude is very clear that these kinds of people are destined to go along with the world unto judgment. Because God is holy and righteous, he will not allow a sin-stained world to remain forever. Which is hard. Because our problems are often very physical, material, here and now. The ones that we are confronted with daily, whether it's a lack of money to pay bills, a lack of love in relationships, whether it's your health is failing, whatever it may be, those are the things that we focus on because that's the here and that's the now, that's what's right in front of us. But it's a slippery slope when you're more focused on what's right in front of you than you are on God. And you'll find yourself sliding down that slope into a worldly mindset that leads to death. So how do we fight this? We can check out the heretics and say, no, we're not going to listen to them. But how do we really fight being worldly minded? I will tell you, it is not going to happen by accident. It is not going to happen just one day you wake up and boom, you're not worldly minded anymore. It is intentional on your part by pursuing a godly mind. Verse 20, but you, beloved. These are divisive people, worldly-minded, devoid of the Spirit, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keeping yourselves in the love of, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. The main command in this passage is verse 21, keep yourselves in the love of God. We are are kept, we're going to find out next week, by God's grace. It is Jesus, as we saw last week, who keeps us in God's mercy. But as much as God is the one who is responsible for our salvation, he has given us a responsibility to respond and to do something about it. We are not simply lumps of clay to be molded. We are made in his image to do what he has called us to do. And so he gives you, Christian, a responsibility. He says, I save you by grace. I grant you faith. I give you repentance. I give you the heart you need. Now do something with it. Keep yourself in the love of God. This is the commandment that Jude gives us. And what he means by that, besides simply keeping yourself protected in God's love instead of seeking love elsewhere, he defines by several different participles, first being building yourself up on your most holy faith. He uses a construction image of you're going to build this building and you have a foundation and you have to choose what type of foundation you are going to lay. Now this is very... Um, Applicable to us right now as a church is we have a foundation out there that's waiting to be poured that we're working on. And we're taking our time because we want to make sure we lay the right foundation. Because if we do the wrong foundation and we put a building up on the wrong foundation, we're going to be eating in there one day and it's going to be a disaster. You want to make sure you have the right foundation. So Jude says build yourself up on the right foundation, which is your most holy faith. What we talked about last week, contend earnestly for the faith. We're talking about the gospel, the truth of the biblical witness. We are talking about the teaching of Jesus Christ. We are talking about you being diligent to study and to know what God's word has said. How do you build yourself up on the holy faith if you have never cracked open the Bible that tells you about the holy faith? 
We have a responsibility if we are to pursue a godly mind to fill our minds with the things of God. And this is the word of God. So we build ourselves up by listening to those who teach the word of God, listening to those who preach the word of God. We build ourselves up by studying on our own the word of God and trying to discern what the word of God means. We take it into our own hands to pursue the godly mind by opening the word of God day after day after day. Build yourselves up on your most holy faith. Pray in the spirit. Relationship with God, like any other relationship, requires communication. And when we don't communicate, the relationship collapses and falls apart. One of the biggest struggles within marriages is a failure to be able to truly communicate. One of the biggest failures in any of our relationships is a failure to be able to communicate. We don't have that failure with God because the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. You see... The Holy Spirit is able to share with the Father the very depths of our soul because he knows us as his creation. You may not always know what God is thinking or what God is saying or what God desires, but the Holy Spirit knows what you need. We pray not as those who are devoid of the Spirit, but we pray in the Spirit, your will be done. And the Spirit prays on our behalf with groanings too deep for words, Paul says in Romans 8. Christian, it is our responsibility not just to read and study God's word to build ourselves up on this most holy faith, to hear God speaking to us, but it is also our responsibility to speak back to our Father, to pray continually, without ceasing, the Bible says, always in communion with our Heavenly Father. And then finally, he says, waiting expectantly for the mercy the Lord Jesus Christ, to eternal life. Jude stays away from the word grace mainly because of how the heretics were using grace. I can do whatever I want, get out of hell free card, that kind of concept. He focuses instead on the mercy of God, and here's the mercy of God. You're a sinner, and you deserve hell. But God didn't give you what you deserved. If you're a Christian here, God instead gave you the faith to believe in Jesus Christ. If you're a Christian here, God instead gave you repentance to turn from your sins and turn to Jesus Christ. If you're a Christian here, you have experienced the mercy of God in unmeasurable ways, but the mercy of God's not complete yet because we're not finished. The mercy of God is not complete yet because while Jesus has finished the victory on the cross and with the empty tomb, It's not done. The war may be decided, but still rages on. Because a day has been set in which God will complete what he has started in us on the day that the heavens are split in two and Jesus Christ comes back in glory and majesty. A day of judgment for the unbeliever, but a day of mercy for you and for me who are in Christ Jesus. He says, That day's coming, it will bring eternal life, it will usher in the resurrection, all of the beautiful things that are the Christian hope, our hope is not in this life. If your hope is that God will give you a good retirement so you can enjoy the end of your days, you have a very foolish hope. The retired people laughed more at that than anybody else. Our hope is not in this life. Our hope is in that day that's coming where Jesus is going to return. Our hope is in that day when our bodies are perfected anew. Our hope is in the resurrection and the mercy of God fulfilled and completed at the return of Jesus Christ. That's our hope. That's what we're looking for. That's what brings eternal life. And Jude says, wait expectantly for it. He says, keep yourself in the love of God by keeping your eyes on that day of Jesus. That day is the most beautiful day that we will ever see. Because whatever this day may hold for you, good or bad, that day makes it all fade away. Because on that day, we behold Jesus. On that day, we behold the Son of God. Call for it. 
wait for it. Keep your focus there on that beautiful day. And you will keep your mind on the things of God. Our mind is very much like a very painful, long game of tug of war. You ever play tug of war as a kid? Get a rope, a few people on one side, a few people on the other side, and you're pulling, you're tugging. You're trying desperately to bring them across the line, and then they're trying to bring you across the line. And when you have two equal forces on either side of the rope, it becomes a stalemate, and you're just moving back and forth and back and forth. That's what the Christian life feels like sometimes, that you're just moving back and forth. One day you're being pulled towards the godly direction. The next day you're being pulled towards the worldly direction. I don't know what's going on, but all it takes is one big kid to walk up and just grab one side of the rope and pull, and then it's over. We don't have one big kid. We have Jesus, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, who comes up to pull us to him. The question is not, can you be godly minded? It's like the question is not, should you stand up and fight for the faith? Yes, you should. And yes, you can. Because Jesus has already done what you need to have done. Jesus is willing to come up to the rope in your mind and pull, and Satan can't stop him. But it requires something. It requires a surrender. To hand the rope over to Jesus and say, you pull. Because I'm too weak. To say, your will be done because mine's too foolish. Your life reign over this. Because my idea of life is messed up. You will not wake up one day and be godly minded unless you spend every day pursuing it. So Christian, what do you have your mind set on? The things of God or the things of this world? One produces death in us. One produces life. Which will you choose? Will you stand and fight? Will you reject the death the world offers and chase after Jesus with all that you are. Christian, which one will you choose? Pray with me. Lord God, it is a humbling privilege to be in your presence, to partake of your supper, to hear of your word. And most of all, to experience your grace, your love, your mercy. Thank you for saving a sinner like me. Thank you, Lord God, for every believer in this room. We are all a testament to your power. We are all a testament to your mercy because we can all testify to our own sinfulness and unworthiness. So we praise you, most high God, for the amazing work that you've done in our hearts and our lives. And I pray that you will continue that process of making us more like Jesus. Help us, Lord, to give over the reins of our life to you. We feel our flesh pulling or the devil pushing. Lord God, help us to surrender our all to you. Help us to pursue you with all that we are. To be so in love with you that we just can't wait until that day that we see you. And forgive us, God, when we allow our eyes to be distracted by the sinful things of this world. Or even not the sinful, just the material things of this world. Forgive us, God, when we settle for less. Help us, Lord, to only be content with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
interesting thing about the Christian life, it is not a call to prosperity, it is a call to a cross. I love the song that they sang, that the mighty cross became a tree of life for me. Has it become that for you? Maybe today you took the Lord's Supper, but you did it in an unworthy manner because you have not put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, because you've not surrendered your heart to Him, because He's not your Lord and Savior. Maybe, like the people Jude was talking about, you've snuck in, you've crept in, you've convinced people, oh yes, they're a Christian, they're a believer, they've been in church their whole life, they do this, they do that, but you know in your heart, it's not true. You can fool all of us, but you cannot fool God. On the day of judgment, you'll stand before God and you'll give an account for your life. And without Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're going to have to pay for what you've done. But the good news of the gospel is that God loved you enough to provide a substitute for you. To provide a payment for you. To take care of that debt of your sin and to nail it to the cross of Jesus Christ. But it requires surrender. And if you feel that pull and that tug in your heart to surrender, that is not from the devil. That is from God. Listen and hand your life over to him. I'll be down here to pray with you or to talk with you afterwards if that's you. But do not leave this place until you know that what this represents, it represents it for you. But then for the rest of us, it's so easy, so easy to be focused on the things of this world, the things of this life. We've got to pursue something better. Don't be content with so little as what this world has to offer. When God has put before you life everlasting, joy that doesn't cease, a peace that is unshakable and beyond comprehension, when God has set before you the treasures of all of eternity, don't settle for less. Christian chase after Jesus. Because when we see him, when we're willing to go to the cross, when we're willing to lay down our lives, when we're willing to surrender our all, when we see Jesus, all the treasures of this world fade away in the light of his beauty and his grace. Christian, don't settle for less. Pursue him. Stand with me as we sing.